Welcome to episode one of the history of Manchester United. Let's go all the way back to before anyone could have known what was to come in the next 140 years. Before the legends of the club were even born, before the club was even called Manchester United. Newton Heath was founded in 1878 by the carriage and wagon department of the Lancashire and Yorkshire Railway Depot at Newton Heath. Despite only being an amateur team playing at North Road, throughout 10 years of playing games against other departments of the railway company, the club began to grow bigger and better and were soon outpacing most of their competitors. They were introduced to the newly formed Football Alliance in 1890, made up of 12 teams from various towns where they finished 8th in their first year. 1892 was their most successful season in their short history so far, finishing 2nd behind Nottingham Forest. The Football League expanded at the same time, merging with the Football Alliance and was split into two divisions, of which Newton Heath and Nottingham Forest were invited to join the first division. By this time the club was completely independent from the railway company and was a football club in its own right. Newton Heath moved on to Bank Street from their first ground the following year, a statement that would go on to have a capacity of 50,000. Despite the burst of excitement in moving stadiums, there wasn't the best of starts for the club and they were relegated into the second division after only three years in the Football League. The location for the stadium was already showing weaknesses by this time, being in an industrial area next to chemical factories. The conditions at the ground were one time so bad that the team that they were playing, Walsall Town, filed an official complaint to the league. Newton Heath won that game 14-0 and then again 9-0 after the league stated that the game would have to be replayed due to the visitors' complaint. The club began spending money it didn't have, expanding the stadium and improving it to attract as many fans as possible. In 1902 they landed themselves a winding up order and Newton Heath faced the possibility of their home being repossessed. This was arguably the factor which changed the future of English football to make it as we now know it, as it led to investment. There's a few legends and stories which surround the club takeover, all involving John Henry Davies and the club captain's dog, a big St Bernard, which had wandered away from a club fundraiser. Some stories saying that he helped to find it, others saying that he was interested in buying the dog. Either way, he met the club captain Harry Stafford and he learnt of the situation of the club. Davies approached Stafford offering to buy the dog initially, but it ended up that Stafford and John Henry Davies bought the football club along with three other businessmen, each putting in £500 and taking on the club debts of £2,670. In his gratitude for saving the club, Stafford allowed Davies to keep the dog in the end anyway. With Davies as the new president, he made bold changes to the club. The name change being the biggest, Newton Heath became the soon famous Manchester United and the club colours were changed to the glorious red and white. At the turn of the century, United's first recognisable names, such as Alex Sandy Turnbull and Billy Meredith, were signed and club fortunes on the field began to improve. It took until 1908 before we won our first league title, which was followed up by the first ever Community Shield at the start of the following season and ended that season by winning the FA Cup for the first time. United were on the road to success. It was like a fairy tale, but the success soon turned into disaster, or nearly did. The FA had outlawed membership of player unions. Many teams decided to withdraw memberships and do as the FA asked, but not United. Knowing that a players union protected the men that play the game, the entire United squad defied the FA and openly refused. It looked as if the reigning FA Cup holders wouldn't be allowed to compete. But at the 11th hour, the FA crumbled after other clubs in the North joined United's cause in a show of solidarity. The ban was lifted the day before the league was due to resume meaning all players were allowed to rejoin either their team or the union that they had left. Manchester United moved on from Bank Street after Davies decided that the ground wasn't big enough for the growth of the club and he was unable to expand in the way that he desired. He invested a further £60,000 into the club for the build of a new stadium, which is just shy of around £7 million in today's terms. Bank Street was sold to the council and rented back to the club while their new stadium was being built. In February 1910, Manchester United moved to what would be its home for over a century to follow, Old Trafford. Located on the Bridgewater Canal on the opposite side of Manchester, the stadium would become one of the world's biggest and most famous places in football, and home to some of the world's greatest players. Old Trafford was christened with an unfortunate 4-3 loss to Liverpool on the 19th of February, and United went on to finish fifth in the league that year. Everything moved quickly for a couple of years, winning a second league title in 1911, but to many fans' dismay, manager Ernest Magnell left for Manchester City the following year. In 1912, United struggled and reached just 13th place. Average match attendance dropped to 15,000 in a stadium that could fit up to 80,000. 
The newly appointed manager JJ Bentley didn't live up to the same standard that Magnell did. The ageing squad nearly faced relegation the following season, being saved by a 2-0 win against Liverpool on the last day. A game which led to a large betting scandal being uncovered and seven players being banned from playing football league for life. The bans, however, were not seen in effect, not for four years at least. The outbreak of the First World War caused the Football League to be suspended. Manchester United had a very expensive, newly built stadium, but no team, no fixtures and no fans coming to pay for its upkeep. Join us in the next chapter as we look at how Manchester United fared between the two World Wars, right up until the appointment of Sir Matt Busby.